answer the question, what is the relationship between our aura or that electromagnetism that emanates from our bodies and that state in which we now find ourselves of presence and immediacy, for want of better words. Or, in other words, the relationship between stillness and movement. We need to understand the intrinsic nature of both movement and stillness. Several stories have already been told, but those stories are needed to illumine another story, which perhaps allows us to get a glimmer of what this intrinsic nature of movement is. And the first story was about that man who fell in love with another man's wife. And they decided and conspired together that they would murder the husband so that they could be together. And this they did. But after some while, the man discovered that the woman was a shrew. So he abandoned her and went wandering here and there, roaming. And everywhere he went, he discovered great suffering. And in the observance of that suffering, he became very remorseful, sorry for his deeds. So there was an occasion when he came to a village nestled at the bottom of a mountain, and the villagers had to traverse a very steep cliff in order to go to the marketplace to ply their wares. So he decided that he would make a tunnel through the mountain as penance and atonement. So he started to dig. But in the meantime, the son of the woman and her husband grew to manhood. And that son swore that he would find his father's murderer and he would punish him, <coughs> slay him. And so the son set out and indeed he did find the man. But when he was about to plunge his sword into him, the man said, please wait. Won't you please allow me to finish my task? And then I'll gladly submit to your sword. Well, the young man conceded to this request. And at first he sat by the roadside while Mando. And then he got tired of watching Mandy. So he decided he'd give him a hand. So every day they got together and they shoveled. And they shoveled. Until finally after some long while, the job was done. There was a tunnel through which the villagers could traverse to get to the other side. Then the man turned to the young man and said, Now, my job is finished. I'm ready. Please, plunge your sword. Tears flowed down the face of the now not so young man because it had taken him years. He bowed before the now old man and said, How? How can I kill my own beloved teacher? The second story was about an old man that they called the old fool. They called him the old fool because he always was coming up with what seemed to be scattered brain schemes. And one day this old man woke up and it so happened that he lived in a village nestled between two mountains. He woke up, came out to his family and said, I'm tired of having to take the long way around the mountain to get out to the other side to go to market. 
I'm going to remove the mountains. Well, his sons and his grandsons thought it was a fabulous idea. They were all for it. But his wife said, you're 90 years old and you can hardly pull a weed out of the garden. How are you going to have the strength to remove the mountains? But he was determined, so they set off. He, his sons and his grandsons, and along the way it so happened that a seven-year-old boy in the village decided to join them. So they went and started digging. And they dug and they dug. When they came back to rest, the wife said, what are you doing with all the dirt? They said, oh, we throw it in the ocean. They kept digging, went on and on. And the wise man of the village decided that he should intervene because after all, what a stupid idea trying to remove. So the wise man went to the old man and said, you know, how can you do this? Look at, look at you, you're 90 years old, you hardly got enough strength to get out of bed in the morning. How can you keep on digging this? How, you, how do you think you're going to remove those mountains? The old man said, it's you who are stupid and rigid. He said, because I'm digging, my sons are digging, my grandsons are digging, and even a seven-year-old boy has more now than you, because the job will perpetuate. My son's sons and their son's sons will continue the task. Well, the wise man couldn't argue with this logic, so he went off, and they kept digging. Well, of course, the mountains themselves became very worried because they could see the determination of this old man and you know, their, their fate was doomed. So they decided to intervene with the gods. So they importuned the gods, please, we're, 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 we're being eroded away here. Can't you do something? So the gods laughed, a 92-year-old man <laughs> tried to but when they looked down and they saw the determination and the patience of this old man, they decided that yes, in the future, those mountains it would be destroyed. So they decided to take a hand. So they gathered great forces of energy and one night, it so happened that one mountain was removed to the east and the other one was removed to the south. And when the old man and his family got up in the morning, the villagers, mountains were gone. There was the freeway for them to make their way to the marketplace. The final story is a story about a man who read a book on alchemy. It captured his imagination, making metal into gold. And he decided this was going to be his task. So he went about gathering all of the potions and elixirs and herbs, spices, that he'd read from the books that one needed to do just this. Well, in the process of reading the books and gathering all the things that it was said were needed, he became quite a sorcerer, so to speak, and people started to come to him to have devils removed and warts taken off their big toe and whatever else their malady was. And so he made enough money to kind of keep himself going and to buy the things that he needed to pursue his task. Now, every night when his wife went to bed, he would go down to the cellar where he had his big vat and he would get down the spices and elixirs and the elements and mix them together. 
but he never did have any success. There was one occasion when he thought he had it. But in the morning when he got up, what had appeared to be gold turned grey and obviously wasn't the real thing. But then one day, after he'd filled his vat with all kinds of elements, his wife came down to him with their son, a little toddler in arms, and said, I have to go out because the servant's not coming today, so I have to go to the market to buy food for the lunch. Here, look after the baby. So he took the baby on his hip, and he continued to stir his neck. But as he stirred, he stirred, and he stirred, and he got faster, and faster, and faster. And somehow, the baby slipped out of his arms, into the the baby didn't make a sound. But when he fished the baby out, it was pure gold. <laughs> How incredible. At last, success. So, with great effort, because the baby was quite heavy now, he was dragged it <laughs> lifted it over to the table. <gasps> Wonder, but just then the door opened and the dog ran in, chasing the cat. The cat skidded, slipped into the bed. I pulled it out. And there was a perfect cat with a mouse in it. <laughs> And the dog, so he popped that in too. <laughs> Luckily, in the dog, so he lined them up on the table. The baby. He <laughs> 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 thought this was amazing. But then he, he could hardly wait to tell his wife. But then he thought, oh well, you know. Maybe she won't be quite as excited as <laughs> Anyway, the wife, who was quite a little person, but quite shrewish herself, came home, shouted from the upper story, because he was down in the cellar, Bring the baby up! <laughs> Um, dear. <laughs> Why don't you come down? <laughs> I have something to show you. <laughs> the wife was really <laughs> So he kind of locked it up and thought, well, maybe they had to leave in a hurry or something like that. 
But then the years passed, and the house became quite dilapidated. Until you know how these things go, they decided that they would have to demolish it because mm -hmm. it was obviously uninhabited. But when they got through the fallen timber and all, they found it. The baby, the cat, with the mouse in its mouth, <laughs> the dog, the wife, and the alchemist. And because they were all pure gold, they were all transported to the king's palace. And I think they're still in his treasury. <laughs> <laughs> the deep meaning of these three stories when we put them together <coughs> relative to what is the nature, the intrinsic nature of movement. What is it now for you? We have this whirling emanation, our electromagnetic field that responds to, interacts with, all of the movement of life. And yet, and yet, whilst it seems to be always in a state of flux and spin and vertical and horizontal, all of those movements, there is an intrinsic nature to it that we become aware of when we become still. Now, have you found it? Do you recognize it? What is it? <coughs> it's called the Dharma. The Dharma. In the will of God. Thank <laughs> you.